Now, I'm not denying that a contradiction of policy continues to persist in our education system. While Indian students are respected across the globe for their hard work and intellect, with outstanding young minds overcoming very competitive selection processes in every field, both in India and abroad, yet we know our universities are consistently unable to find a prominent position in global rankings. Uh, it's a frequent and increasingly frequent lament at the top of our political system that there is no Indian university figuring in the top 100 of the Times Higher Education rankings, the top 200 of the QS World University rankings, and so on. Even the QS Asian university rankings doesn't rank an Indian institute in the top 30. Now, one of the reasons we don't do so well, and we actually were curious enough to call these folks in and get them to tell us how they weighted their various rankings, uh, one of the reasons is, in fact, that we don't have um, the, the kind of research output that they give excessive weightage to. In the case of the Times Higher Education Rankings, 30% is directly for research, and a further 30% of the ranking is for citations, which, of course, come from published research. So our longest tradition of having universities that teach and research institutions that are small, specialized places that don't do much teaching have segregated um, universities from research in a way that is simply not the practice in the rest of the world. And that's one of the major reasons for our ranking deficiencies. Uh, but it's also true that despite being home to one-sixth of humanity, or as I tend to put it, 17% of the world's brains, we still only produce 3.5% of global research output, according to Thomson Reuters figures. Now, one reason for this thin trickle, as I said, is this traditional model of higher education that segregates research from the undergraduate science curricula in our country, and we've been determined to do something about it. The UPA government has taken an important step in transforming this model by setting up five new Indian institutes of science, education, and research that are dedicated to scientific research from the undergraduate level upwards and to have elite, high-quality science education to international standards. These will be the sort of IITs of the science research world. And they've already taken off extremely well. I can speak from one, in, which is not far from my constituency, that I have visited and been hugely impressed by. Uh, my ministry has also recently allowed foreign universities to operate in India without a local partner if they can set up a company under the Companies Act. And all of this means that we are anxious to improve the exchanges of skills, experience, education, and opportunities, not just between students, but between educators. Now, while the UPA government has taken several measures to foster a culture of excellence in higher education, radical success requires commitment from various stakeholders. New models of public-private partnership in higher education are being encouraged not only for technology-intensive education, but also for multidisciplinary and research-based education in the social sciences. Special emphasis has been placed on the expansion of skill-based programs for higher education. I noticed you have an entire round table on skill development in this conference. A framework for setting up community colleges based on the North American model is under development. And um, the Ministry of Human Resource Development, uh, in fact, we're planning, by the way, on this one to set up something like 200 uh, community colleges in India and to explain what they are in our concept anyway the idea is to have a halfway house between a conventional university and a purely vocational training center. So a student who hasn't done academically well enough in high school to get into a conventional university would go to a community college where they'd have a mixture of some academic courses and some vocational courses. Um, if they just had a, a lapse in high school and actually have an academic inclination. They do well enough in the academic courses. They can then, two years later, move back into the university system. If they are really not cut out for the academic life but really have some vocational talent, they can leave with a vocational diploma that will entitle them to qualified employment around the country. So that's the, the whole concept. Now, with a view to expanding student choice, and increasing the design of innovative interdisciplinary programs, we've also created the meta-university concept as a network of universities. Uh, this would also enable several universities to come together, offering courses across disciplines, uh, treat faculty and students from all institutions alike, and provide all network members access to content, teaching and research support from all the universities in the network. Uh, one point that, um, that uh, we should really spend a bit of time on, but more time than I have today, is more academia-industry interaction. 
Um, we have been increasingly concerned about the divergence between what you learn, even in engineering and technical colleges, and what the marketplace demands. I think FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, did a, a survey that said that 64% of employers were not satisfied with the quality of applicants for jobs coming out of our engineering colleges. So um, one of the obvious solutions is to engage industry far more in what's being taught in these colleges so that you would actually have relevant curricula and the students would be coming out having learned things that employers actually want them to know. Um, another uh, obvious area for academia industry interaction is in the financing of research, something quite common in many Western countries, relatively uncommon here, in fact almost unknown here, for a company to turn to a university or an IIT and say, look, if you have students who can look into this and this and this, we're willing to finance it and we can cut a deal on what happens if we apply your research commercially. This kind of thing which we have no objection to as a government, but which we haven't done enough of in India. Uh, we have done one thing in the regulatory field, which is insisting now that anybody who wants to open a polytechnic in India will have to have a tie-up with a nearby industry. Because we were sick of hearing that kids are coming out of polytechnics, having been taught by people out of textbooks that were 30 years out of date on equipment that was no longer being used in industry, and then having to, to look for jobs. Whereas, whereas uh, if indeed polytechnic faculty can spend some time, say the summer months, in a, an industry, and see the latest industry practices. And if the students can get internships there and the industry can come and advise on curricula, you can actually have polytechnics being a feeder line into, into industry. And so this is the kind of thing we're much more conscious about in, this, uh, in UPA2 than we have in the past, and we're pushing this very hard indeed. Literacy, of course, can't be overlooked in all of this. It's been an important thrust area for the government. Obviously, reading and writing are mandatory for navigating an information-saturated world. So we lost the Sakshar Bharat program in 2009 to further promote and strengthen adult education. We're doing, as I said, very well in primary education. I think it's been estimated that 95% of, of 12-year-olds in India are literate, even if it's a fairly basic level of literacy. Our illiteracy figures come from the ones who missed the net earlier, the older kids, the older adults, I beg your pardon. And so we're aiming at covering those who missed the opportunity of formal education earlier um, and, and feel a lead, need for learning of any type, basic literacy, basic education, which might give them an equivalency certificate to formal education, vocational education and skill development, physical and emotional development, practical arts, applied science, sports, recreation, all of this comes under the ambit of, of, of Sakshar Bharat. And the, the principal target of our mission is to impart functional literacy to some 70 million non-literate adults uh, above 50. So we're also targeting, of course, some of our more underprivileged communities, scheduled caste tribes and so on, minorities. Uh, this has been a, a specific focus, and particularly women, who very often in an earlier generation were told by their parents, waste of time sending you to school, come back home after just having been there a couple of years. Um, and, and we are, we are indeed uh, improving, improving that uh, considerably. But looking at the state of education in India in 2014, despite the dysfunctionality of the previous parliament that has left so many education bills languishing, as Professor Mattu has rightly pointed out, I do not feel pessimistic. Of course, there's much that needs to be fixed urgently, but I'm sure we have the resources and the expertise to do it. Uh, we can diagnose the problem. We also know how to fix it. Most important, for the first time in our five millennia of our recorded history, we have a clear vision of what we need to do, and the common citizens of India have come alive to the transformational possibilities of education. Whatever happens in these elections, I intend to be a voice in and outside Parliament on these issues, and I hope to remain engaged with all of you who care about the education of young Indians. Thank you very much, and Jehan.